Oh, yeah. And uh, he views Christianity with uh, such disdain that it just comes through. You, you can see it in the discussions that he's had um, after his uh, film has been shown. Mm hmm. So sorry I brought you back onto that topic. I just no, uh, no problem. <laughs> um, so we were talking about um, usury, and we were trying to define interest and and Jesus's perspective, and and kind of getting back to uh, I guess that. Okay. Uh, Jesus said it so perfectly when he said, "There should be no one poor among you," and he also said something which you might think contradicts his first statement but it actually doesn't the poor you will always have among you in other words there should be no one poor among you but there will always be poor among you in other words circumstances happen uh, you get fires floods whatever okay you will always have the unexpected that means you will have systems of credit even if you don't have currency you can agree to um, use or um, output your labor at a certain rate over a cer certain period of time. You don't even need currency in that case. So um, biblical capitalism, uh, especially among the Israelites, is fascinating to me because every 49th or technically the 50th year you'd have the year of Jubilee and every seven years you have what is known as the Shemitah which means the release where all debts were canceled now that is a fascinating and, and wonderful concept because a if you're someone who is rich you get to keep your profits b in the six and a half uh, year of a seven year cycle, if you come up to me and say, I need a hundred thousand dollar mortgage, I'm going to go, no chance, buddy, because the Shemitah is coming along and uh, I'm going to lose a hundred grand, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, what that does is it limits indebtedness. In other words, you, ha you have to have indebtedness, it, it takes money to start to make money, but. You don't want to go crazy over it. And it never compounds more than seven years. And this is a beautiful system, which, of course, um, God set up among the Israelites. And then, of course, the priest class totally violated with all kinds of rules and regulations and, and rituals to try to get around that. And, of course, it's very... A, a, a moot point to discuss that now because it'll never be practiced. But the principles that we can learn from the Shemitah, from, from the release, are there. And so what that teaches me as a Bible-believing Christian is that debt is necessary, but don't be ruled by it. It's better to be, to be humble then have all these trappings with our second and third mortgages and a car loan and a vacation loan and a student loan than it is to, you know, just live humbly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. Um... Because the Bible says the borrower is what to the lender? A slave, to, slave the lender. to the lender. Slave, that's right. And the Israelites were initially not supposed to have a king. But like little children, they said, we want a king. We want a king. And God said, okay, you're going to get a king, but you won't like him because he will what? He will drag you off to war and make you his slaves. And nothing has changed in thousands of years. Uh, every time I hear that phrase, it just comes back to me. What, what Solomon said, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. You got it. It's like Babylon is in front of us, but isn't there yet. It's the already, but not yet. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a quick, I'm going to try to make this a quick one. Um, but in, in talking, uh, you've done so many interviews and everybody, it's such a hot topic, 9-11, since it's so recent. And, you know, such an insane circumstance. But with with the World Trade Center, 
um, I I know that I, I've heard this, and I just kind of wanted to confirm with you, but that the Twin Towers, there were records kept there, and they were destroyed. And I guess in accordance with the switching of office from Bill Clinton to George W. Bush, um, that some something happened where um, there was a big surplus with Clinton, where we came out of debt magically. And then I guess in conjunction with the Twin Towers going down, I guess what I've heard is, is that $40 trillion were wiped out of the national that debt. That is correct. I, I will question that figure, but the figure is quite large. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, treasury bills were all piled up in Building 7. And uh, I found out since the release of my first film that both, um, uh, let's see, Marvin Bush and... Uh, Oh, what is his name? Um, not Herbert Walker. No, I know you're talking uh, about Wirt, Wirt, Wirt D. D. Walker. D. Walker. Yes, Wirt D. Walker. So uh, we're uh, members of the board of Securicom Stratasec, mm-hmm. which is providing the security for the uh, World Trade Center complex of seven buildings, not just two. Yep. And that contract expired on September 10th. 2001 so you have uh, a member of the bush family on the on the maternal side and the paternal side uh in charge of security in the world trade center complex whose contract ends one day before september 11th but i guess that's just all coincidence oh of course right and um there is an excellent uh, series of interviews of uh, a gentleman by the name of richard grove who was supposed to attend a meeting of uh, Marsha McLennan, who was in charge of all those securities or had a major hand in those securities. And the maturity date uh, for those securities was September 11th. And of course, those uh, those treasury papers were, were never, never reached a maturity date because they were all destroyed. And um, if people ask me, you know, what is the primary motive for 9-11? I would have to say one word, money. Because let me just connect all the dots here. Um, the war on terror, even if it ended today, uh, has cost, is costing, and will uh, will cost the United States taxpayer, uh, thanks to withdrawal costs, approximately $6 trillion. Wow. That's right. So just keep that one figure in your mind. Then add to that figure the several trillion dollars worth of uh, securities that, of course, never reached a maturity date, uh, housed in Building 7, which wasn't hit by a plane, wasn't hit by uh, splashed by burning jet fuel. And then on the day before September 11th, September 10th, Donald Rumsfeld gets up in the Pentagon and says, we can't account for $2.3 trillion of United States defense spending. And the plane that hits the Pentagon manages to hit the only section of the Pentagon under construction, being upgraded to make it impact resistant, (laughs) and happens to hit the accounting division of the Pentagon which is physically opposite of the command and control division of the Pentagon where Donald Rumsfeld was. Now, you add $2.3 trillion to $6 trillion to $2 trillion, and um, (laughs) you quickly, uh, you know, add things up here. And that's not all. Because in the basement of the one of the Twin Towers, uh, Scotia Makata, which is one of five authorized gold dealer, or gold dealing or bullion banks, had hundreds of millions of dollars of deliverable gold stored. And there was a truck that was busy stashing gold bars just before the towers collapsed. And there was a small trail of gold bars, which dumped off this hastily loaded truck. Leonard, I mean, it's, it's so funny that you bring that up. I used to work with a guy who was a surveyor, and September 10th, 2001, 
um, they they were somewhere near the World Trade Center, and I, I, I don't remember why, but he, he said there were like these armored trucks. There were tons of them underneath, just coming out of from underneath it, like tons of them. Absolutely. So, if people ask me, you know, what's what's the bottom line, the motive for September 11th, and I say, well, you know what? Um, let's start with 12 trillion dollars. <laughs> yeah. You know it, and then. There's the whole control aspect of it. And then there's the whole spiritual aspect of this. I mean, the this gets really deep, and I'm not going to get into any detail about this topic tonight. I'll just bring it up. George W. Bush, in his either his first or his second inauguration speech, made specific occultic references. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with this. Angel in the whirlwind, right? Angel in the whirlwind. That's right. Okay. And unless you are familiar with the occult, you will have no idea what he just said. And that is a reference to Metatron, which is a ancient Kabbalistic demonic entity which is generally believed to be assigned territorially to Babylon. And we all know that the Tower of Babel or Babel was not about the height of the building. Very true. It was about the fact that it was some kind of structure and or device that was, as the Bible says, was able to reach into Shemayan or the heavens the spiritual realm. So now you have the Nephilim trying to interact with humanity on a mass scale after the flood. And the Bible says, you know, there were giants in the land those days in Genesis 6. And also after that, that is a reference to the Tower of Babel. And what was the first thing that United States Special Forces and Rangers did in the war on terror they, they went for the the ancient babylonian artifacts mm. that's right and don't think that there isn't some satanic drive to recreate the tower of babel using the knowledge that hopefully they were ap- that, that they were after And don't think that that is the only attempt to break into the spiritual realm because at the entrance to the CERN superconducting super collider on the border of France and Switzerland is the goddess Shiva, which is the goddess of destroyer, the the destroyer of worlds. And the logo for CERN is 666. And when Oppenheimer was interviewed shortly after um, the quote-unquote success of the nuclear bomb, he was asked, what was going through your mind when you saw the first nuclear explosion in Nevada? And he said, and I quote, I recall the line from the Bhagavad Gita where the prince is in front of Shiva in its multi-armed form and says, I am now become death, the destroyer of worlds. Wow. And this is what was going through his mind, Oppenheimer's mind. And don't think that the nuclear explosion that we saw in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and in Nevada was without its spiritual side because that is the definition of alchemy, turning matter into energy. Einstein's equation proves that energy is matter and therefore matter is energy. And the Kabbalists out there and the occultists out there want to turn matter into energy so that they can reach the next uh, dimension. Wow. You know, Leonard, I watched recently a special. It was like a four-hour special. I didn't watch all of it. I kind of skipped around because it was at nighttime and I was actually pretty tired, but about the pyramids and Mm -hmm. what those pyramids did and something about energy. And it's just a theory, but if, I mean, does that make 